But Microsoft game uh, division for a while. Uh, now he only answers to the CEO at Microsoft. He is the man, the myth, the legend, I guess for some. Obviously, I don't think most people consider him on like Satoru Iwata, Miyamoto level, um, stuff like that. People over at Sony as well. But uh, he is, like it or not, the leader of Xbox. And he had some interesting things to say because he destroyed fanboys i mean absolutely eviscerated them uh and he's not just talking about fanboys of playstation and nintendo he's talking about fanboys of xbox too he addresses all of it uh in fact he says if nothing else it's fanboys that are going to make him leave the industry which in hindsight that's kind of a comment that uh is only going to fuel the playstation fanboys as they try to drive phil spencer from the market but i think he's more concerned with the fanboys on his side of the fence who really knows? Um, but let's 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 get into uh, the the question here because he did an interview with The Verge, and they said you mentioned people lining up. There's all these cultural things that happen at a console launch. People line up, and then there's waves of unboxings. Then one thing that mystifies me is there's a wave of people who run over the new Xbox with their car and smash it with a hammer. What goes through your head when the inevitable people smash my new console is happening and the next phone call is with your retail partners to figure out how you can get them more? He, Phil Spencer says, to be honest, I love the industry I'm in. This is the job I love. My wife will tell me it's the only job I'm qualified for, but this is definitely the job I love. But that tribalism in the industry, if there was anything that would ever drive me out of the industry, it's actually that, what you're talking about. It's kind of weird because he gets into this with very minimal probing, but he definitely cares about it. I look at shipping a product, shipping a game, as one of the bravest things a team can do. You put your product out there. It gets analyzed and prodded and reviewed. It can't defend itself. It's an inanimate object. You can't go to the internet and defend it. We've seen that way too many times. That never works. When a team releases something into the market for the world to tear it apart on the internet, it's just such a brave thing for the team to do. I'm never going to vote against any creative team or any product team to do poorly because I have a competitive product. It's not in me. I don't actually think it helps us in the long run in the industry. But especially in the console space, there's like a core of the core that have, I think, taken it to the destructive level of, I really want to f want to fail, so the thing I bought succeeds. I'm saying on both sides. I'm not saying that it's all people crushing Xboxes, and everybody that loves Xbox is always completely inviting to all the PlayStation stuff. I've said before that I find it distasteful, but maybe that is too light. I just really despise it. I don't think we have to see others fail in order for us to achieve the goals. That's not something that kind of kumbaya thing. It's actually real. We're in the entertainment business. The biggest competitor we have is apathy over the products and services and games that we build. We see that today. Everybody is doing well in the industry right now, for the most part, with the stay at home and the surge. That's what we have be focused on as an industry. We've done it with things like crossplay and other things that we focused on breaking some of those tropes. But there is a core that really just hates the other consumer product. Man, that's just so off-putting to me. Again, maybe that word is probably too light. To me, it's one of the worst things about our industry. Then uh, The Verge goes on to say, I always tell our team that rooting for failure is just a bad place to be. You should root for success. It makes you happier. Phil Spencer said, I've said it before, it's not a two-may-enter, one-may-leave scenario. Could you imagine if you were a director of a movie and you wanted another movie to be so bad so that people would... Uh, maybe directors do that. But, and then uh, the, the Verge says, I feel like there are some directors that do that for sure. Then they laugh. Phil Spencer goes on to say, maybe they do. I could see, maybe. I don't know. In the end, we know there are millions and millions of people that are going to end up with a Switch, a PlayStation, and an Xbox in their home. Those are great customers. They're going to buy the games they want on the platforms where their friends are or where the exclusives are, whatever it is. It's not a world where in order for us to win, Sony has to lose or Nintendo has to lose or Steam has to lose or something. If it is, it's not really Microsoft business. What I mean by that is Microsoft has this perspective. I mean, you look at our market cap. You look at the businesses we aspire to go be. I can't target Microsoft and say, hey, the board of Microsoft, our enemy is the Sony company. We should go take them out. 
It's not even in our vocabulary to talk about Sony that way. They're a partner of ours, frankly, in a lot of different places. Our ambition has to be a global business that's growing, that's going through transformation, where Microsoft has some real opportunity to help with that transformation and play an important role. That's how we frame our opportunity in gaming. And then uh, The Verge says, to launch a console, you don't need... You don't just need hardware, you obviously need big games. Sony launched the PlayStation 5 with Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Astro's Playroom, which take full advantage of the advanced haptics on its new controller. I asked Phil how he thinks about the role the titles play in the launch of these systems and how he feels about Halo Infinite being delayed to 2021. He goes on to say, We were very public about Halo Infinite and our desire to have Halo at launch. I do think there are some great launch games that are there to go play that maybe get lost in the dialogue about who's got the better launch lineup, which is a downside. I'm playing a lot of Tetris Effect with my friend, uh, Mitsugushi, and the team, and it's awesome. We wanted Halo at launch. We thought it would have been a real cultural moment for us as X at Xbox. The last time we had done that was with the original Xbox and Halo CE. From a business standpoint, I'm selling every console I can build. It's hard for me to point out how I would be selling more consoles today. I wouldn't be. There's also a fan promise that that's not lost on me that people want to see new great games that play on their new platform that they purchase. That's a commitment that we believe in. We've made huge investments in our first party games in growing the amount of games that we can build that can be special on Xbox, that can be there for our Xbox fans so that they feel like they have made the right purchase. Halo was a miss on our part. We couldn't change we wouldn't change the decision based on the right game a healthy situation for the team and how they're working absolutely it's something that we had planned for bonnie ross who runs the studio and i to have halo there in the long run i think what's going to happen is we're going to get a better halo game at a good time when people can actually get a console i feel good about that I think the game will be better for the time that we're giving it. I'm incredibly excited about the lineup, not only of Xbox Game Studios, but we've obviously announced our intent to acquire ZeniMax and Starfield and great games that Todd Howard and the team are working on that people are going to go play on their Xbox. I feel good, real good, the best I've felt about our roadmap. But yeah, I would have been really great to have Halo at launch. And the interview goes on to touch on a great number of topics, including uh, Phil Spencer's rise from, you know, the bottom rung all the way up to where he is today, uh, going through three different CEOs, including one of the founders of Microsoft and Bill Gates. So it's really interesting and a really nice read. Uh, one of the better interviews I think I've seen of Phil Spencer that covers such a wide array of topics. And Phil Spencer, for those who don't know, he's such a willing conversationalist. He will talk and talk and talk passionately about video games for hours on end because he legitimately cares about this industry. We have talked about, you know, how maybe we miss Satura Iwata at Nintendo because obviously he was a gamer, a game developer first, and then he became a businessman last. And, you know, he has that, uh, that famous line out there about that, that he, he popped off at an award ceremony or at a conference, I should say. But the thing is, it's not really about that. Like, we, when, when we lost him and, you know, got replaced with a couple others, now we're on Furukawa, who is more on the business side of things, more on the money management side of things, not really necessarily a gamer. Furukawa is not necessarily a, pro, a video game developer at all. Not, like, not even necessarily. Like, he's just not. Um... We're left with a Nintendo that, that, while it's doing fantastic in the marketplace, also almost feels um, like there's not a, a head of the snake. Like, Satoru Awada was very much the head of Nintendo at the time. You know, Reggie fils was very much the head of Nintendo of America at the time, whereas Doug Bowser and Satoru Furukawa are more in the background. Uh, Doug Bowser comes out, uh, you know, from the cracks here and there, but in general, these guys are in the background doing their jobs versus trying to be these figureheads that passionately care about gaming. And the same is basically true over at Sony now. Ever since the former CEO stepped down that was passionate about games, I'm not saying the new guy in charge isn't passionate about games, but he's not like at the forefront of people's minds. He's not, um, you know, the person you think of. You don't think PlayStation and then associate it with the CEO like you used to, like you used to do with Nintendo. But it's almost impossible to think about Xbox and Microsoft and the Xbox game division and all that stuff without first saying, hey, that's Phil Spencer right now. Like, he hasn't always ran the show, but he runs it now. And he is someone who passionately cares about this industry on the whole. Remember, he once said that Nintendo is a treasure that the industry should preserve. 
if a time comes, obviously, that Nintendo ever does falter to the point that it needs to be protected so it's not bought out by some company that's going to run them into the ground. And that's obviously an extenuating circumstance that is unlikely to occur, but it's just crazy awesome to see a leader of a company, and I, I get it, you Sony fans out there, some of you in particular that he's actually talking about, are going to be all over Phil Spencer on these comments, and that's fine. I think Phil knows that. I think Phil is just pointing out that fanboyism is toxic. Fanboyism doesn't serve anyone good. And none of the three companies should be looking at each other as I need to do something so this other system doesn't do well to make ours do well. And I don't think they view it that way. Obviously, there are some decisions that are made. There was internal discussions. He talks in this interview about internal discussions about releasing two different platforms at two different price points. And and one of the uh, key points brought up, you know, is that Sony's not going to do this. Clearly, they are consider the competition because they are a business. But just because they make considerations and decisions, maybe based around what other companies might may or may not be doing, doesn't mean they're doing that to put those companies down. It's more like they're trying to position themselves in the marketplace to be successful it's not like they thought oh you know if we do this and we release a 300 dollars system we're gonna crush playstation 5 like no they knew playstation 5 was gonna do well obviously switch is already doing well they don't want these platforms to do bad the wide diversity growing gaming market is good for everyone including gamers especially gamers because we get a wide more a bigger variety of games that end up performing well so honestly uh Kudos to you, Phil Spencer. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, most others aren't willing to talk about this, especially at the corporate level. It's nice to know the person who runs Microsoft is very much against the toxic fanboy culture that exists. And hey, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I haven't been part of that toxic culture at times. We, I, I think deep down, many of us as gamers have participated knowingly or unknowingly in part of that toxic culture. Uh, and obviously as a YouTuber, you know, anytime that a negative piece of news comes out about Sony, about Microsoft, about Nintendo, it feels like, and I say this as someone putting the video out, it almost feels like I'm contributing to that toxicity when really I'm just talking about things that I think could get better or should be done better or should be done differently rather than me saying, F these companies, F that company. Like, nah, everyone can do things better. Anyways, I'm Nathaniel Robojans from the Center Prime. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next video.